on camera. Today is March 6th, 2020. Uh, my name is John Lilly. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center and with me is Sue Verhoff, also uh, Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Fred DeRazio, who served in the, um, the Third Army in the, in, in, in the Army in World War II. Mr. DeRazio's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us, Mr. DeRazio, and thank you for participating in the project. To begin, would you please state your full name and date of birth? Alfred John DeRazio, born 2-20-26, in Franklin, Massachusetts. Thank you. Uh, Fred, who were your parents and what were their occupations? Uh, my mother and father, they were immigrants and they came over from Italy. And uh, my father worked on the railroad all his life. And uh, my mother stayed home and take, took care of the ten kids. So she had, a, she had a steady job. Who were your, uh, who, who were your siblings, uh, names and genders, and which, if any of them, served in the military? I had uh, five girls and five boys in my family. And uh, four of us were in the army at the same time overseas, World War II. And my younger brother was in uh, Korea for two years. And uh, we were lucky we all came home. Two of us were wounded and uh, we survived. It was a little rough, but it was, yeah. we made it. What, what were your feelings about joining the service? How, how did you feel about it? Oh, we all wanted to go in. And uh, so as soon as I turned 18, they drafted me. So yeah, we all wanted to go in. And like I said, my first brother, he was a volunteer in 1940. And uh, he stood through the war, he got out of 1945. So uh, we were lucky we all came home. How, how did your parents feel about your enlisting? Well, uh, they figured it was our duty to go in, and that was it. And we all thought the same thing. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that nobody wanted to go in, but uh, it was, it was a challenge, though. But uh, were there any mixed feelings? Uh, with your parents because they were Italian immigrants and we were, of course, at, at war with Italy. No. No, that's what a lot of people thought would happen, that they wouldn't fight. I stayed alone at all, over 50 kids, on, guys on it in the service. Wow. And we only had a short street, right? That, uh, yeah, they, well, we all, had, everybody had three, four, five people in the service. They, well, the Italians had a big family. <laughs> So, uh, but no, there was no hard feelings. We had to go in. That was our duty. Well, what about your schooling before you entered the service? Um, That's what, right. Your schooling? Where did uh, where did you go to school? Uh, oh, uh, I went. Uh, I went uh, through high school. I graduated. In fact, uh, I got my papers to go into service, and then I got papers two days later, and they said stay in school. I had two more months to go, so they made me finish school. And if I didn't finish school, I would have gone in with my oldest brother. He, were, he didn't make the first draft because he was too old, but when the Germans broke through, they, were, they, they uh, drafted all the older men and the men, married men with kids. They were, uh, that's a, that second batch went in. So I almost went in with him. Imagine that. <laughs> Did, did you hold any jobs before entering the service? No, just uh, uh, in the store after school. But, uh, I went right in, I was 18, so I didn't have a chance to work. So, uh, why did you join? What, was, what, were, what were your thoughts before you held up your hand and said, I do? How did, how did you feel about joining in and going service? to fight yeah, the oh, service? I was ready. Okay. I guess we all were. We, uh, 
I didn't hear anybody say they didn't want to go in. Uh, how did you how did you get to your initial point of entry when you when you enlisted uh, and then uh, were I drafted you were dra you were drafted <laughs> yeah. yes okay yeah um, so w tell me about the training that you had in the service you talked about infantry school a little yeah. earlier so so tell me about how that went was that after basic training or as a part of basic how did that go that was that's all we had was basic training we didn't have any special training at all we would. We went in and uh, they'd, start, they'd take us out like 4 5 30 in the morning and uh, if we come back for lunch or something or, or supper, then we go out again. We probably wouldn't go back to 11, 12 o'clock at night. And uh, <laughs> people, people say, what you, what'd you do for fun? I said, we didn't have any fun. There was no, no such thing as time off. They, uh, they just kept training us, and of course, half the time they didn't give us enough training. But uh, but they had, they were in a rush to get us overseas, and they pushed us over. So we we were supposed to have 16 weeks, but they cut two weeks off of that, so we could get out of there and go overseas. And this was 1944. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, it took us, I guess, 10 days to get overseas. They were in a rush. So how did you get overseas? How, what was the transport? Oh, I got the picture over there. It's uh, the Ile de France, the fifth largest uh, cruise ship in the world at the time. But they put bunks in there, ten uh, up to the ceiling. <laughs> it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a cruise ship then, but uh, we didn't have no escort because we could beat a submarine. There's a, fast ship. So we went to Glasgow in Scotland and uh, then we went down Southampton and then we took a, a boat to uh, France. When we got to France there was all ice and snow and it was awful. But uh, that was only the start of it. Our transportation, freight cars. It was it cold in the freight cars because you can't close those doors tight. In fact, yeah. first night we got dust in the snow on us inside the house. It was cold. So it took us two days and two nights to get over there. But they stopped for a hot meal, the first meal we had for a while. But uh, yeah, they stopped. I don't know how many people on that train, thousands, I guess. But uh, after we got through eating and walking around, so one of the guys was inquisitive, so there was a wooden tanker there. So he stuck his bayonet in the middle of the tanker, and he kept digging with his bayonet. Oh my gosh, the wine came out. We, you never see hundreds of guys line up so quick. So we filled up our canteens and mess kit. <laughs> So then we walked around, and so the guys, somebody broke the lock on the, another freight car. It was blankets up to the ceiling. I'm telling you, we all took one blanket and went back to the tr train. So, we yeah. about tw 20 minutes, half hour later, the train's throwing down. I said, oh. So somebody said, a lot of MPs up there. I said, maybe the, we thought maybe the Germans broke loose and we couldn't get by. The MPs were looking for us. They took all the blankets away from us. You know why? They, they were going to give them to the civilians. Well, and They were, were freezing there. And, uh, so and, was, was there any wine left by then? <laughs> uh, the, the wine was all right. We kept that. <laughs> so you had a little bit of help with the, with the cold, huh? Uh, yeah, that it was real cold. Wasn't it? So, so this was France, and and yeah. what what part of France were you in at that point? Where, where did you enter France? I don't know where I was in the middle of it. Okay, there was a uh, very few signs any place in the both all the countries because they're either blown up or 
thrown down or something. I always remember one town or city up in Luxembourg, uh, Luxembourg yeah, Actronaut. I always remember that name. I, I look at the map, I, I know where I was there, but there wasn't many uh, signposts. So, what kinds of um, what kinds of friendships did you make with your with your with your buddies? Did you oh, oh. did you form good, good oh, friendships? Oh yeah, we um, were all the same age. They were all the same. There was only one guy. He was twenty five. We called him the old man. He was twenty five. But uh, no, there was almost just about ever just got through graduating from high school. So made friends pretty fast, and uh, well, and you have to because, like I say, you, you, your life might depend on it, on your friends or next next to you. you know? So right. Uh, so you were you were in a rifle company. Yep. So tell me about the company uh, and the platoon. What about your platoon sergeant? Uh, what what was he like? Ah, uh, well, they. They're all right. I mean, they're, they're doing their job, but uh, it's you couldn't make friends with him. You know, the, they they don't make friends with uh, new people because they might not last long. long. But they're all right. They don't have any problems with them. Yeah, I guess you can understand the way that people who had been in the theater for a while That's right. looked at the new guys because you guys were just cannon fodder. You were well. The way they talked about us, uh, I, I thought I was in the wrong army. One one place, the uh, the officer said, "Look at them; they don't know what they're doing." Of course, we don't know. I never fired a rifle or a pistol or nothing. I don't know. And then, and then suddenly you ought to to kill somebody. And uh, but uh, and then the other another general says. They froze their feet on purpose so they wouldn't have to go to the front lines. Well, I, I froze my feet first before I went to the front lines. Well, so they couldn't accuse you of that. Yeah, right. So, was there any uh, any sense? Tell, tell me about how it was with with the Third Army. Uh, was was there a sense that that Patton was was bent and determined to get you guys in? Was there a sense that you all were better than the other divisions? Well, How did that go? <laughs> Patton was always uh, Patton. I mean, uh, he, he was a good general and all that, but uh, he uh, he really didn't care how many men were wounded and all that because he says. Oh, I can get you more replacements, but uh, I mean, he was all right because uh, he's trying to win the war, and if he did more than a lot of other ones that, that did it, you know, up there. But uh, uh, well, if he had, if if you all, if he hadn't come along when he did, the Battle of the Bulge wouldn't quite have worked out the way it did. That's would right. It? Yeah, because that that was set to be a he real. Was, he was the one that said. They says uh, we need somebody to go up in, in a, a two or three days. You know, nobody else said a word. He says I can make it, and that's when the the, the other general says, "Oh, they they're gonna because they like you." He says, "No, in spite of it, he said they're gonna make it." Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. They 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 drove up there and they, they relieved the guys. So how did how did it feel when you when you Relieved the troops that were already there. How did how did, how did were, you, were you were you scared? Were you uncertain? Um, you mean up to the front? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a little anxiety, I think. You know, you you don't know what's going to happen, and uh, you know you're going to be up to the front because if you're a rifleman, you got to be someplace up there. So, but. Uh, yeah, you kind of expect it. So, so so when you got to the front, um, how did how did things go? I mean, what what how how long were you there before you were before you were sent out of theater? Uh, well, uh, 
On the first night I was up there, I was up on a foxhole, well forward of the line. I had a, I had a guard the machine gunner. Then the next three nights we were along the river in case the Germans came back to, uh, to Luxembourg. Not you. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I don't know that. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but, uh, and then a few days later they send us all the way through, uh, up to, into Germany. That was a long ways in there. We, we had to walk. Oh, they promised us a bridge and you're going to be nice and dry. You're going to have hot food. It, they told you anything about Santa Claus wasn't going to be there. But anyway, the bridge never went up. And Santa Claus wasn't there. No, I hear them. And then uh, all that ammunition and stuff, they promised us, well, we didn't have no boats to take it over, so we didn't have nothing. So uh I had two bandoliers of ammunition, the same thing I had two months earlier. <laughs> never gave it. Never gave us something that, well, we couldn't take it. Then we didn't have nothing, nothing to eat that morning. That hot food, mm. the truck was still there when we left. They didn't, give, they didn't feed us. And then the K rations, no K rations. And so <laughs> then just before we got on the rafts, the, the, the voice came from the hills, drop your belt. So now we didn't have no food, no water, nothing. So, so then, then what happened? Well, then we walked, and we walked. We walked a long ways. We couldn't find them, but they found us. When I turned around and I looked down the hill, the shells were hitting our men all the way up. So when I saw that shrapnel coming, I said, well, I better not stand here because I'm going to get it. You know you're going to get hit. So I laid on the ground like, one arm over my head, one in front of my face, and I just laid there. So I got hit up in the hair and my elbow, the one I had around my head. So, uh, like I said, we stood there, what, three days in that mud. Uh, it's kind of rough. I'm sure. So, so what were you thinking about when you were lying there in the mud? Waiting. I don't even know. Uh, I guess I just wait for some hot food or something. <laughs> but uh, or you're waiting for a truck, truck or something would come. Along. But there was nothing, no ambulances, no trucks, no jeeps, nothing. They hadn't put the bridge up. So. So what happened after that? At the end of those three days, then, then what happened? Uh, I woke up. I didn't know where I was. I felt warm. I said, well, "How come I'm warm?" Because they, they told us when we went up there, if you ever freeze to death, just before you freeze to death, you you will get a little warm spot. I said, "See, yeah, why am I warm?" You know. So then when I opened my eyes, I said, "Oh." The, the operating light was on up the top, and the uh, first thing I saw were my feet, they were black. So when I, the nurse came by, I called her, you know, she said, she wouldn't tell me nothing, so I called the doctor. So the doctor kind of said, what's the problem? He said, my feet are all black. He said, I can't help you. He said, the frost went too deep. And I didn't argue with him because they were cutting off toes and feet up there. Oh, we heard about it before we went over. But, uh, it was kind of rough to, to... Well, so I was glad they didn't... I mean, I suffered all, that, all those years, but all these doctors say they're going to help me, but they, can, no, they can't help you. So, so you can't, can't be still hurting yet. I don't even argue with them. So how long were you in the hospital? Uh, uh, let's see, we, from there, 
I was I used to watch that MASH program, and so I thought what they said. You stay in that hospital only two days, and so I started ticking off the time, and I says, uh, and then they come for the second day, and I says, oh, I says, come and get me, you know. So late in the afternoon on the second day, somebody came up to me and says, we're moving you to England. You're going to the hospital in England. I said, thank God. So, uh, so I went on a a hospital sh a train, you know. So uh, that's where we went. We crossed the uh, yeah, English Channel again and went uh, up into Wales, the western part of uh, England. So I, I was up there when the war was over. And uh, they moved, they emptied uh, all the hospitals they could. If they, unless, if they couldn't move you, They'd have to leave you there, but they filled up five, five transports, all from the hospitals, and we went into New York, the whole five ships at one time. Boy, the people blowing their horns, and I'm telling you, the fire boats are out there. Everything. It was a, it was a good feeling. I'm sure. Yeah. So, so. By the time you got home, could you walk? Or did you have to use a, a crutch, or how did you? I had crutch. I had uh, crutches, and but uh, that uh, they 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 gave they gave me the wheelies. In fact, they gave me a a scooter too. Yeah. Yes, I think I deserved it. <laughs> yeah. So, so what happened when you when you got home? Uh, were you were you discharged uh, right um, after that? Did you go into the hospital again, or how did no, that I go? was in the convalescent hospital down Camp Edwards, the down the Cape. Okay. And then after that, uh, they gave me a medical discharge, so I didn't have to stay there any longer. And and this was m late 1945 by then. Ah, uh, what time? When was that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So you, so you got the medical discharge, and then what happened? Did you go home? Yeah. So after that? Well, I had to go back to hospital visits and checkups and all that. Right. So what was life like after after the war? Uh, what did you do? <laughs> what was your next act? It was almost as bad as before we went in. Hey. Discharged 14 million people, and there was no jobs. The same thing as before we went in. That's my, that's why my brother volunteered to go in here because two of his friends have told him they were going in. He says, "Ah, I don't want to go in." They says, "Well, oh, come on." So the guy, the recruiter, promised them everything. They promised them they'd be together in the California National Guard. You know, one went to Alaska. One went to the Panama Canal, and my brother went to uh, Hawaii. Well, wow. <laughs> and he never came home. Five years. So, so tell me about your your brothers. You talked about the one who went to Hawaii. What did he do in, in Hawaii? Well, at first he was in headquarters company, but then when the war started, and they went to Guadalcanal. He and up in the infantry. And my uh, my other brother, the second oldest, he was in uh, Africa in the uh, invasion of Italy, and uh, he he was near Monte Cassino. He got shot in the hip, mm. so that knocked him out of the war. And uh, so, uh, of course, I'm getting tr Belgium. Belgium, yeah. Oh, my oldest brother, the one that didn't go in the first draft, he and uh, he went in the artillery. I guess they felt bad for him. Didn't put him in the infantry, so he went to France and Germany. So we were all overseas at the same time. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, what about your career after after the service? Uh, once you once you were able to, once you were 
treated and, and could get around as well as you could, then yeah. what did you do for the rest of your... Well, I machine shop and uh, different jobs. Uh, worked for the ground force on the F, uh, airlines. airlines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I worked for them 18 years on the airlines. Since since Jeannie's here, you apparently had a had had a mate. So tell us about her. What about your wife? Well, she was our first one, but we decided to keep her anyway. <laughs> Looks like it worked out all right. Oh, that worked out. That worked out good. Yeah, yeah. So other 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 children? Yeah, we had two boys and two girls. Okay. In fact, the boy. He, he came from California for my birthday. He surprised me. I didn't know he was here. And my other daughter was from North Carolina. And she flew in. I didn't know she was here. <laughs> they surprised me. I ended up with 30 people here for my birthday. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. So how did it feel to be back, be a civilian again after you had been in the Army? Uh, it felt good because all the guys were home from the service too, and so they we all got together all the time, and it was nice. So you kept up with with friends you had met in the service. Uh, a few of them, but then I don't know what happened. Uh, they stopped communicating. Then, but one of them did come down to Florida one time. His wife, him and his wife, come down to see their son. So my wife and I met them, and we, we spent the day with them. It was nice. felt good. I don't know what happened to the other one. He was supposed to... I don't know what happened. He's supposed to be operated on, but then they, he begged him not to cut his leg off, and they, so he said they didn't. I, I, I missed them after that. I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes uh, it's kind of hard to stay connected. Right. You're... you're your life doesn't have anything to do with their life at that point, yeah, so no. you don't have anything in common anymore. No, they were, everybody went to school and different things, and that was it. Did you ever join any veterans organizations? Yeah. How did that? Tell me about that. Uh, well, first one I went to the disabled veterans, and uh, wait a minute. Yeah, that was that was one of the first ones. Yeah, but then I moved and uh, and they uh, it was too far away, so I joined the VFW. So uh, that's most one we mostly go to every weekend. So you kept up with that? Yeah, we we go there every week. Oh, still, she okay. Does too, okay. Her husband is uh, from Vietnam, so he goes to there too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how did your military experience affect the rest of your life, aside from the obvious issues with your, with your frostbite, but, but just in, in general, attitudes, uh, discipline, things like that? How did... Well, I guess you always uh, learn from that experience, yeah. yeah it, was, it was an experience, I'm telling you. <laughs> but, uh, you know... If you maintain that same thing as when you go in, you're all right. Because uh, I didn't have any trouble. Never had any trouble. So you think you learned you learned skills that were <laughs> skills and habits that and were useful. So. Discipline, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you grow you grow up fast, oh, don't you? That's right. Uh, were there any life lessons you learned you, you, you learned from the service uh, aside from the discipline uh, about uh, friendships, things like that? Uh, I think so. I think uh, you learn a lot. You be, make friends and all that. That was, was a good experience. Any any uh, any friends in particular that stand out? Any any. Any people that you wish you could talk to now and are not oh, able to? Got a couple of them, yeah, it would have been nice, yeah. Who, who, who were they and where were they from? Uh, one was uh, from Haverhill, Mass, and the other one was Stoughton, Mass. And uh, that wasn't too far away from where I lived, so. But uh, it was a good experience. 
Do you think you became friends because you're all from that part of Massachusetts? No, I think more or less because we're all the same age. That's what I think it was, yeah. I thought it was maybe because you could understand each other's speech. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. They're still making fun of her. <laughs> um, has your military service impacted the way you feel about the military in general? The fact that you were in the military, does that, oh, does that, how does that affect the way you think? You have about a lot it? of respect for them. Anybody's in there now, you have respect for them. I do, but anyway. Would you like to leave any message for, for future generations, for your, for your children or grandchildren or great grandchildren who might watch this in, in the years to come? Is there anything you'd like uh, to say to them? I always appreciate what the people in the service are doing for the country. It, uh, it means a lot to, to back them up. Some people don't, don't talk too good about the military, but uh, you got to admit, a lot of times, it's not their fault that they're in there, but you do the job. If you're in there, you do the job. That's all. Well, we appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about your service. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered already? This is your time, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we covered pretty good. Okay, so go ahead. I'd like to take you back just a little bit, Fred. You talked about coming across on the Ile de France yeah. and the bunks. Describe what that was like. What was a typical day like? How did you react to being in the, had you been on the ocean before? What was that like? No, I never was on an ocean liner before. But uh, I was very happy because I was on the top bunk, way up on the top. <laughs> and uh, some, pe some, some people weren't uh, exactly all, all there, their stomach. <laughs> I'm sorry, but they, uh, a lot of people got sick. But uh, it was crowded, oh, I'm telling you. It was a fast ship. It's a good thing. I get the picture over there. They, uh, she bought some cookies one time, and they have the picture of the flag in there. It, it, uh, it was the ship. I said, oh, I got it. And the other time I went to the uh, grocery store, and the manager was emptying up some cases, and I, there was a big map there of the Ile de France. Yeah. <laughs> What was the food like? Huh? What was the food like on ship? Uh, it was kind of rough. The ship was kind of, it was winter time, so the, the weather was rough. And uh, then uh, when you went to the English Channel, that uh, was a bad one. Like they always say it is, it is, believe me. Wow. They, they were, they were going to let us go over the ladder. And the ships were banging together. So finally somebody smartened up and said, let's use the ramp. <laughs> yeah, they were going to go over the rope, but they had a ramp there. But uh, that, was, that was a rough trip. Yeah. And then when you were in Germany with your unit, you've talked a little bit about, you know, the frostbite and a little bit about your wounding. Describe what a typical day might have been with your unit. What kinds of things did you do? Do you remember dealing with the German people or the people in Luxembourg? Well, well we, didn't, we didn't see none of them, we're, the section we were in. There was nothing there but uh, a lot of land where we walked in and uh, we didn't see any of their people. But uh, we saw people like, I think up in Luxembourg we saw some people. Those people really eh, enjoyed us. They, uh, they appreciated us. Because they were cut, they were occupied by the Germans at the time. So, uh, do you do you know how far you went in to Germany? How, in any sense of how how how, how many days did you did you walk? Uh, uh, might have been three days. I don't know. Okay. It, uh, 
We don't know how far we went in. There was no signs or nothing. We didn't know where we were. It was near the, somewhere near the Siegfried line, but I don't know how far in. Any other memories and experiences you had while you were in Germany and Luxembourg? Anything stand out? Any clear memories you have of that time? Not too much. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. All right. What was it like hearing that the war had ended? You were in a hospital in England. When yeah. Happened, what was that like? Oh. Everybody was so happy. Um, because you didn't know if we were going to go back in again or we were going to go to Japan or what, you know. But, uh, yeah, it was. People don't know how many people we were going to lose in Japan. It was rough. What was the extent of your wounds? You said you were wounded in your shoulder and your. In yeah, your I like. About eight months, I guess, I, they healed up. Because my elbow was a lot of little bones in there, and I couldn't couldn't bend my arm too much. And the other one was a soft spot, so it healed up pretty good. Awesome. Hmm. Um, I guess the only other thing I'm wondering is your mother really sacrificed having all of her boys. Did you have much communication with letters from home? Were you able to? Not a lot. Because mail was very slow. Sometimes you get out three or four, and sometimes you don't get any. It depends, you know. But uh, my sisters used to write all the time. They all, oh yeah, they always wrote. Did 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 you all ever compare letters from your sisters or your mom to see if they wrote the same things? Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> that would have been hard keeping up correspondence with that many, yeah. that many people. Yeah, I know it. But uh, they always wrote and everything. I know she says, really. It, was, it got a little expensive. She used to try to send us food or something, you know. But uh, they always communicated. Did the, did, the, did the food get there most of the time? Yeah. Is it dry food or something, you know. But it was good. Yeah. I had... I had a bad experience when I came into France. I uh, we were walking across the street in the ice and snow there, where the it was melted and all that, and I fell down. And then I got up, and when I went to get to the tent, I went to see what time it was. I didn't have my watch, and uh, I I felt like I. I had tears in my eyes because my sisters bought me a watch for graduation and uh, they didn't have the money. I know they didn't have it, so I felt bad when I lost it. But and I didn't have it that long, but the, in those days the, the band didn't last too long. So I, I couldn't get a new band because the war was on. So that's why I lost it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the weather wasn't very good. <laughs> so you didn't have the equipment to handle the cold weather? Did you no. Did have any no. kind of outerwear? How did, you, how did you cope with that at night? How did you sleep? Well, I didn't sleep in the, at a bed at all over there. Right, but how did, how did you, what did you do to try to stay warm enough to try to drift off when you're sleeping on the ground? Yeah, sometimes we slept against the bushes there, or it was a uh, no place you could keep warm. And they told me to, they told us to keep your, check your feet every night, wipe them dry. And I looked at them one time. I never looked at them again. They didn't give me nothing to wipe my feet with, and my socks were soaking wet. So I just. Rung them out and put them back on again. Only one pair of socks? That's all. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you know how many other men in your unit were wounded at the same time you were? You said you could watch the shells walk well, up. No, I don't know how many, but I saw them get hit. And uh, 
quite a few of us get hit and out. There was only one regiment went in. The other two were in reserve. <laughs> in case you needed help, but they you never seen them again. They so, never came in. So you were you were you were the lucky ones. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh but that was you fighting the the elements more than you were the the, uh, the Germans, you know. But uh, they didn't seem to care to leave you out there. But uh, well, of course that you you complain. They say there's a war on. <laughs> uh, I think that's pretty much it. Okay. Jeannie, do you have any questions? Anything that he's talked about before that you haven't heard today on tape? Um, no. You know, he's lived up here with us for the last 10 years, so we've really gotten to hear a lot more of the stories because, like, we've been very active with programs and everything to help him go to the World War II roundtable and, and be active in the, uh, the veterans and everything. So we hear a lot of the stories and everything, but it's just still hard to comprehend that an 18-year-old who has never been out of Franklin, Massachusetts, you know, it's just hard to still comprehend it, even at this time, you know. Um, now we hear so much about the war and it's all on TV and it's instantaneously trying to find out the information and where they're going and what they're doing and then it's hard to comprehend, you know, his, my grandma having four people and not speaking the language and everything when she's hearing things going on, which is probably just as well. But still, it's hard to comprehend. You have four kids around the world, and you really don't know, you know, what's going on with them or anything. I just can't even imagine in this day and age. Never mind having another, being in a foreign country, speaking a different language, and one of your sons is over in your homeland, and you know, it's just hard to con. To up that, that, the mixed feelings and everything you must have, pride along with being very frightened for your family. I mean, you know, it's just hard to comprehend. Not having enough food, because people these days can't even comprehend not having enough food in the military. You know, he'll talk about having, a, you know, a quart of milk going, you know, for 18 people at the table, and, you know, if someone took too much, you got nothing. You know, I mean, so we can't even believe that you don't have the right equipment and clothing and the shoes and socks and keep things dry or have enough food or drink and milk. You know, now you're not drink, now you're not eating, now you gotta drop your belts and drop what little water you even had left. You know, it, it's, it's just hard to comprehend. And I understand now why they say it's the greatest, the, the greatest generation because no one has any comprehension on World War I or World War II. Oh, you know, the, like you said, the elements, you know, in, uh, in basic training, right next to the mess hall, there was a 10 by 10 square uh, room with a heavy, thick uh, metal fence with a padlock on it that loaded with uh, apples, oranges, bananas, all kind of fruit. In four months, you know how many times we got that? Not once. Wow. We never got it. There's all kind of rumors that the cook was selling it. The cook would say, one day he came up to me and he's talking. I said, what the hell is he, why is he talking to me, you know, about spaghetti? He says, I cooked 40 pounds of spaghetti. He said, they ate it all. I said, I told him, I said, that's not much uh, spaghetti. You got 120 men and they're trained all day long and they're hungry. But the, in the breakfast, 12 men, all we had was a bowl of soup, uh, soup uh, cereal every day, and a cup of coffee, and one quart of milk. Mm, wow. If the, somebody <coughs> took a little bit of extra milk, you drink it, you eat your breakfast dry or your coffee black. You never fed us. That's kind of hard to believe, but that's true. 
Tell us a little bit about your food on the line, what you ate when you were on the line. Oh. To, no, they didn't feed us, really. Yeah. One day we had a, a sea ration, but uh, nothing fresh or nothing like that. Never. I, we never had bacon and eggs or something like that in the morning, never. So, so what was in the sea ration package? Uh, it's, uh, that was the dry food, yeah. Uh, that was K-ration. C-ration was the, the canned stuff and all that. But they, when we left there, they were just about starting to get the beanie weenies, the good stuff. <laughs> mm. Yeah. But, uh, no. We never got much to eat over there. Did your brother ever talk about, your brother who was in Italy, did he ever talk about what that was like, being in Italy and fighting in Italy when knowing that's where his family came from? Well, no. You'd be surprised how many fellows from our hometown served there. He saw them. He saw them. Oh, yeah. He used to write letters to the, to the newspaper. And they love they loved his letters because they says he he tells everybody what their sons are doing. It's like he meets four or five guys and he, he writes home. He was writing home. Yeah, they uh the paper said these are the letters we'd like to get. And uh he he go to the Red Cross and he turn around and there's two guys from hometown there. Another time he's on the curb and out there in Italy and uh, those guys looking them up and down, <laughs> they find out they know each other. <laughs> yeah, he, he saw quite a few guys from my hometown. And then uh, beside him, we get wounded. Some other guys from my hometown was with him, and he, they got wounded too. And they, so they, uh, they had a good time together. And uh, yeah, he, my, my, my brother likes to talk to them anyway, you know, so I just, yeah. I, my other brother there, five years, I don't think he told, he's talked more than a couple of sentences to me about nothing. He didn't talk about it. In fact, none of us talked about it. And uh, the only thing he told me one time, he says, if the Japanese uh, landed troops and when they bombed Pearl Harbor, he said we wouldn't have been able to stop them. He said they didn't. Didn't have enough men and material and stuff. Do you think, why do you think people don't talk about their wartime experiences more? I guess a lot of them probably more or less want to forget about it anyway. Yeah. Sometimes, if you talk about the good part, then it's not bad. You know? <laughs> and most people wouldn't understand the bad parts anyway. That's right, absolutely. Well, anything else, Fred? Anything else you'd like to mm. tell us about? No, uh, I'd like to show you my office. We we will come look at it, yeah. and and we would we would like to thank you so much for your service, oh. and thank you for doing this with us. You're welcome, sir. Thank you so much.